Well, hello one and all for the first time ever. I'm doing this as a video record. So uh, Jeremy Price very kindly stepped in as my guinea pig to run an interview over the video and to see what would come out. But more importantly, because he and the guys at Graphic Studio have got an incredible event, an incredible event coming up in a week or so's time. It's the Graphic Studio Live Lounge. I'm Paul. This is the Mastering Portrait Photography Podcast. <laughs> Well, hello. I hope you're well. I have to say, I'm a little bit bouncy today. Uh, this morning, I went and had my COVID vaccine. I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea why I suddenly found myself on the list. That's a conversation I'm going to go and have to it have with my be GP because. You're because... Old. <laughs> you're not supposed to be interjecting with humor at this stage <laughs> i just did, i just i got the invite and i went because uh i assumed given even the queen is saying i've got to do my bit for the country off i went and did it i have to say it was wonderful uh and i'm gonna give a big shout to the nhs to the volunteers to the numerous hundreds and hundreds of scientists around the world who are giving us what is in my opinion the only only route out of this dreadful pandemic. Uh, it's the one bit of this uh, podcast where I'm going to give you clear instructions if you get offered the opportunity to have a vaccine. For Pete's sake, go and do it. Because until enough of us have got the vaccine in our, in our bloodstream, we're going to be constantly in and out of lockdowns. So please go and do it. Uh, and this is me talking, not Bill Gates. Obviously, now he's in, obviously injected in my bloodstream. Have you had yours yet, Jeremy? Uh, no, I haven't even had an invite. I think it's because they want me to uh, crash and burn sooner rather than later. <laughs> they look considerably older than me, I think, so I think you should have been offered already. I think the postman keeps throwing my letters away. That's probably what it is. Oh, is that what it, mine came by text. I was completely thrown by it. Um, but it was lovely. It was, and everyone was really positive. How are you, Jeremy? Are you well? Yeah, do you know what? Actually, all things considered, I really can't complain. You know, it's been a tough year for everybody, tougher more for some than others. You know, we've had to work our asses off to go backwards. But, but nevertheless, I think right now, along with many others, seeing this root, this much ever emerging light, whatever you want to say, um, has brought a lot of positivity. And it's clear blue skies where I am at the moment. It's warm yeah. and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you have a smile on your face because the sunshine, it's warm, you know, and life is looking positive in the future. So, so yeah, not non chamali as they say in the two, non chamali pretty good actually. Yeah, I have to say, you can feel the mood lift. And on top of that, of course, with the government announcements this week, uh, my inbox, my email inbox is suddenly alive uh, with a mix, actually. It's been a mix this week of uh, lots of new portrait inquiries, which is great, lots of headshot inquiries, because everybody is now trying to get their personal brand sorted. Uh, probably, though, my guess is they won't materialise really until everyone's managed to find themselves a hairdresser, because this is what happened last year. <laughs> well, I opened, I opened the studio up, nobody came, and I started to ring people, and they were like, no, I'm not coming until I've had a haircut. Great, that's not that helpful. Well, I've, I've, had, um, a, I've had a few Miranda cuts, um, and uh, the, the, last, the last couple, when she goes, whoops, that's uh, when the clippers are on a number one. Um, or a number two, <laughs> and then you hear a whoops, and then you know it's and, and so long as I can't see it, it's fine. But then she's going, sure, well, I can see it from behind. So I can't, it's fine, I don't care. So, um, but yeah, looking forward to all of those things. Most importantly, seeing people. Do you know what? That for me is seeing people that we know and love and have friendships with. You know, I haven't appreciated how much not seeing people would, would change us. You know, and it really has done. We, by now, we would have done multiple shows. You know, it's, it's almost into yeah. March. And uh, yeah. I think not seeing people has been a, a, been a huge effect on many people. But overall, yeah, yeah I think good effects. The only thing I'm, I'm feeling is, I think, I, and I hear these stories about people who have been sort of kept hostage for a while. I'm ever so slightly nervous about being let out again. I don't know why. Right. I'm really I'm... nervous about you being let out again, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Invite someone on your podcast, be abused by someone on your podcast. That's obviously the way to do this thing. That's very funny. Uh, so across the patch, what stories are you hearing? Are you, I mean, you're plugged in across pretty much all social photography. What are you hearing about 
the feelings of photographers, the customer base? What what stories are you getting? It's it's still fairly mixed. I mean, obviously, from the very outset, there was this whole wave of okay, so how do we remain positive at the first lockdown? You know. Portrait photographers managed to open and start doing some work. Wedding photographers like, well, we still really can't, can't do very much, try to do what they can. I think there's a cautious optimism, generally. Many people are going, well, we're actually seeing, yes, still seeing some weddings postponed. We're seeing a, a more start up again. We're getting bookings coming in. Uh, portrait photographers, again, waiting for the doors to open. But I think there's also a, a slight nervousness of just, just in case you know, well, let me hold back a bit of my emotion slightly just in case something happens. But I think overall, most of the people I'm talking to are busy on the phones. They're busy rearranging weddings and planning and things like that, making sure that they can fit the dates in that the people want. I think cash flow is absolutely critical with so many people yeah. that, because it has been such a long time since many people have earned some of some have managed to get some support from the government some good support some less good some have had none at all and uh, you know down to your own personal circumstances it, it's been a quite a mixed bag in terms of finances but pretty much everybody's reaching the end of their pot in our world you know there's a lot of people yeah. out there who have been on furlough on 80 percent and not spending any money or you know they can't spend any more with amazon or they've been on full salary working from home <laughs> You know, or if they've been a, a, a state worker, you know, most of the state workers have been on full salary working from home or working, you know, so there's, you know, it's five million people work for the government. So there's, a, there's people out there who've got money sitting there that haven't spent it. But I think in our world, everyone's going, you know what, we've just about managed to get through. We've, we've kind of scrimped safe. We've done what we can to try and earn some money. But it's now that, right, we've really got to get this happening now. But I think on the whole, most of the people I talk to, like at last, we have a plan. Mm. We'd love it sooner. We'd love to have weddings open up sooner. And why can't, if you can open up a stadium, why can't you have a wedding with more than 15 people in it? So there's all those, still those arguments backwards and forwards. And there will be forever and a day, those arguments as to who's, who's right, who's wrong, which scientist is doing the right, saying the right thing, you know. But, uh, but ultimately, for the bulk of us of the population that's involved in social photography, we have a plan. And I think that's the yeah. most important thing. Yeah, I mean, my view on the, the wedding thing is I actually think they've got it about right. And much, and I'm suffering too, you know, I'm a wedding photographer as well. And, and we have, like all wedding photographers, the double whammy of not just the fact we haven't been able to shoot the weddings, but right now we're riding another tidal wave of postponements. And those postponements are now bumping into the existing bookings we had for later in the year and for next year. And that's going to be lively. But I think the big difference between like a theatre or a stadium or a sporting event and a wedding is weddings are a multiple, are a multiple of smaller events, 30, 50, 100 people who are going to get drunk and hug. Sports stadiums typically are not quite the same thing. Uh, also just, you, know, you, read, you read all these things out there. People say, well, why can't you just, why can't you do that? And I think it's inevitable there will be people that will not be happy. But we're all not happy. We all, you know, we want to get yeah, back to work. Happy. You know, and, and, yeah. and I think there are so many people going, I've never realised how much I miss working. And, yeah. and, and one of the funny things is I, I was talking to uh, Maria Michaels uh, earlier on today from Dateo, the pet photographer. She said... I'm really nervous because I haven't properly picked up a camera for a while with in front of a client. And, and yeah. you know, it's that's kind of that novice excitement coming back in again because you've not been in front of clients to do things. And I think that's going to be an interesting time too. So, so um, that's yeah. going to be fun. I say, I, 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 I have to be fair, I have been working, uh, luckily, the hearing dogs. Not that I'm a dog photographer. You know this, Jeremy. I'm not a dog photographer. I'm not a dog photographer. Uh, but the hearing dogs have been busier than ever simply because usually they have a huge, a huge wealth of socially generated media coming in from all their volunteers, and the volunteers aren't allowed out. And so, actually, I've, I've had more work from the charity that we support than ever. And at the same time, I switched over to a mirrorless camera. I, I jumped. Uh, so we've been, I've been working flat out trying to figure out how to use this thing uh, and go through a whole sea change, which is a whole different topic for a different podcast. Uh, one interesting number I did hear, I think I heard it on one of the BBC podcasts, was there's about, the government has spent between 300 and 400 billion pounds keeping us afloat as a nation. But there is our savings. People have saved up somewhere in the region of 250 billion 
is in private savings accounts, additional money that they haven't spent, they've earned and haven't spent. So that, the worst bit of this whole story, of course, is it implies there's a very big wealth divide coming. Uh, I mean, there's, that's just not fair or right. But from a business point of view, all of us have got to figure out how to tap into the undoubted energy for people to do things they haven't been able to do. And that includes, of course, for me, portrait photography. Uh, and I'm, I'm really hoping that what you see and, and keep me posted on it is you see an uptick uh, in the portrait photography side. The wedding photography side has a much longer lead time. You know, we will see this play out. Working on all 2020 wedding albums. So we have kind of yeah. a, we've got a six month wait before the yeah. wedding photography business starts to come back into us. And uh, so yeah. we've, we've, you know, everyone says, yeah, we're all back to work. And of course, then furlough <laughs> schemes are going to run. And we're going, yeah, but actually, we're still not earning anything yet because these guys haven't submitted yeah. your wedding albums yet. So, but that said, yeah. you know, as you know, we work hard in the portraits world now. So we're, that's one of the things that we're, we're pushing. But just looking outside of kind of our worlds and just hearing and listening and talking to different people, that, that you know, the, the, what we do understand, what we do feel is that people are valuing their family more. They're valuing their, you know, the experience that they've had. They're, they're seeing the loved ones that they've sadly lost, both as a direct as a result of COVID, but also during this time that they would have lost anyway, but they've not been able to see. You know, they didn't get to see their granddad pass away of old age. They didn't get to spend time with families. So I think, that, I think there is a, a, re a revisit of people looking at their family, their family relationships and valuing that a little bit more. And I think, I think it's incumbent on all of us in, in our industry to remind people about that because it will be quickly forgotten, I think. I yeah. think quickly people try and get back into normality and they will forget you know, what's happened during this period of time. And I think it's up to us to remind them, you know, do you know what? The most important people in your life, what have we found out from this? Is that, you know, how much we cherish our loved ones and our family and how much we've missed being around people. So I think if we can all aim towards that, it's going to help release that uh, that uh, that money sitting there waiting to be sent, to be spent. Yeah, I think, uh, as a fact, use the word, it's behooven on us, because that's a word I learned from you. Uh, I, think, I think it's important that we take this forwards positively that's 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 because at the moment it's very easy to be negative about the things that we can't do still but actually what we're seeing particularly in the uk and, and to an extent in the us if you happen to be watching this or listening to this in israel of course you're the world leaders in a rollout or the rollout of vaccines and you know if if well, so it's about 9 million, isn't it? So we're, well, we're 70 million, aren't we, in this country? Um, but the point being that all of the efficacy studies that are being done now on people who've in the real world, not the data of clinical trials, but the actual data is suggesting that all of these vaccines are incredible. Yeah, I mean, within a year, within a year of them discovering this virus, we had safety tested vaccines out there. And I think Let's build on that positivity and the fact that, you know, this year I'm looking out of our windows and the sun is streaming in. You know, I, I made the mistake of going to have my uh, vaccine this morning, though, in a, in a sweatshirt, you know, in a you know, hoodie so they could unzip it. Forgot that it was about zero degrees out there. I was flipping freezing. <laughs> well, you, you say that. You wait, you wait till the fan mail starts coming in because you look like a boy band, you know? <laughs> but I do think I do think we all need to be positive and energetic in coming out of this thing. Um, I think the the days of you know being miserable and doing our navel gazing, recriminations, and everything that's got to stop because that's not going to attract customers, um, and it's also not very nice. We had a live event with uh, Jerry Jonas the other week where he did a shoot design and um, uh, talk about a programme we are working on. But in it, he gave us this little piece to, to, put, to send out to people. And, and, and he says, in these challenging times, we were reminded that the health, safety and strength of our bond with our family and friends and the quality time we spend with them is the most valuable thing in life. What yeah. better way to celebrate these relationships than beautiful photographs? And that, you know, just keeping people reminded of positivity about those, those great things about each other. And, uh, and I think we can keep all doing that and just keep people going, you know what? Yeah, it is time to have a family photo session. It is time to get, you know, to take my dog along to Paul Wilkinson to have it photographed. <laughs> I'm not a dog photographer. <laughs> Honestly, I know I get that. 
You've never won any yeah, awards no. for your, your dog photography <laughs> either, have you? Yeah, no, I've won a few, but it's, it just I, it just makes me laugh, really. Uh, definitely a people photographer. You know that, Jeremy. You know that. I do. Don't worry. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun, to, 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 fun to, to pull your dog lead from time to time. So, Well, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, one question I had for you. Are you hearing... Because uh, one of the things I'm looking at now is whether we can start the commercial side of the business safely. And I know that uh, you talk to a lot of photographers. Are you hearing that happening out there? Yeah, we've heard quite a lot of people that actually are carefully creating and doing certainly product shoots and things like that they've been doing. Headshots yeah. is one of the things that people have tried to sort of try to fit in. It's always a great challenge. You know, are you doing, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And I think that's one of the, one of the important things. You know, we've seen doorstep photography and we've seen all kinds of different things. But from a commercial photography point of view, yeah, for sure, we are, we are starting to see that working certainly some extended product photography um, and when it comes to business alliances photography as well so creating uh, common in, common interest in, um, shoots that enable you to have those business cooperations so yeah we're, we've got a number of projects we're working on and actually indeed um, starting off a number of charity books too so that's something that we'll talk to you about later on the, yeah. um, there, there's been some there's been some very good stuff coming through our our world and i think because quite a lot of the companies and as you already alluded to this with your with the hearing dogs have very little content they need content um certainly you know we discussed previously about you opening up your your image bank to, um, to the manual and uh, and that inspired others to do very very similar you know it's like okay so what can we do with our business partners you know from a commercial point of view to start generating some fund or to help them that's going to give put us in better stead for later on so i think there's been some that you know in the worlds that we inhabit in commercial photography and with um, architectural photography uh, and stuff like that we, we're seeing those things starting to uh, well actually have seen them roll along it's not a world that gives us huge amount of print yet but um, that it, there is a there is a place for that for us because of what we're doing with the new print system we installed. So something else that uh, we'll be talking about too. I, th I certainly think, uh, from a commercial point of view, we're looking at that now as how to use printed product. I mean, I, I had I, I pitched for a wedding yesterday. Actually, I pitched for a wedding yesterday. Stood in the cold. Um, had to do a, a a dry pitch. Basically, means I did someone called comes to the studio. It's a client I was working with. Um, and she asked me to quote. So I gave her a price list. I gave one of your magazines. Um, I'll say it was my magazine you created. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not your magazine. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. Beautiful. And it, it's the tactility. It's the tactility of it. And I described our albums. I described the boxes. But I was able to give uh, my clients uh, the magazine but I think we're this year we're exploring yeah like there's, that's not it's actually not that magazine because of course it's the wedding one I gave I've got a different one uh, yeah but I'm glad you carry that around with you uh, <laughs> well, like someone on the street that needs it for warmth eh? you're just gonna eat. <laughs> but the thing being that uh, the tactility of it when I gave her my price list and I knew that if I just emailed my price list I was going to have an uphill battle to describe clearly and in terms that meant something what it is to have great customer service, to create beautiful images, and just as importantly, to have something tangible, not just your husband or your, or your, your, your new betrothed, uh, as a takeaway. Uh, wedding ring, you know, these are the things, but of course the printed material is it. But also we're now this year looking at expanding our ability to use printed material you know, whether it's uh, magazines or flyers or albums um, into other areas. And you're right, the charity book one is an interesting angle, which we're looking at. But I, was, I, was I did a tie yesterday. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is completely, we're doing this, we're making this up as we go along. In case anyone's wondering about whether this is a scripted podcast, I had three points. We've done two, I've got one left, but this is now completely off the cuff. Look, uh, I still have this in my bookshelf. Jerry Gionis, Jerry Gionis, gorgeous. Signed by Jerry. Uh, more importantly, because I have it on my library, I don't know how often I actually open the book these days. I must have poured over it in the years I've had it. But what I do is it's, it just has this 
beauty about it, as do all books. There is something about printed material with photographs in it, photo books, albums, whatever. They're, they're, for me, at least, maybe I'm old school, but for me, at least. So we are looking for avenues this year to properly stamp that down. Because if you do the numbers, the leverage on the investment is actually really well paid back. Well, we, we, um, we've seen the magazine, growth of the magazine sales has been quite phenomenal. And interestingly enough, although quite a few people do use them as their business magazine, you know, their, their company intro, whatever it happens to be, the, the business alliance magazines, the, where the photographer has gone into somewhere else to create magazines for them or common magazines or indeed in, in other areas, has actually been greater than in terms of the numbers of magazines made than the photographer's own one. Because the photographer's own one, they'll give out to the right clients. And so the, but you know, most photographers that are trying to charge you know, good prices for their portrait business and their wedding business, they will be looking at, at not thousands of magazines. They don't need to. You want to have to the right client. But interestingly enough, those that are working well with the magazines, and, and I finally persuaded Miranda to uh, to do a half an hour talk on this, what she's done with the magazines um, on, our, on our event next weekend, which I know we'll chat about towards the end. Um, yeah, you might want to explain to who Miranda is to, to hundreds of people or thousands of people these days who won't know who, who that is. My girlfriend, partner, and uh, she's a um, newborn and family photographer. And so, she, but her background is in marketing, so she's uh, she's got a lot of marketing expertise and graphic design. So, so she's seen that the uh, how the magazines themselves can actually present a far far greater capability for her uh, and expand not just to sell the magazine but generate leads for her. So, um, but yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say any more because she's got her own talk to do, which she's uh, yeah. madly prepping for. So, um, but. But you're absolutely right in terms of utilising printed products. I was having a conversation with Sean Conboy about the very same thing as well. He's been used to shooting incredible architectural photographs, but then they just go and he sees nothing that happens to him. Why shouldn't the photographer be the person that offers the, you know, the great books, you know, the corporate profiles, the, you know, whatever it happens to be that a marketing agency might come in to do? Because it's these days... You know, where you would go, well, I don't touch that because that's a marketing agency's job. You know, you can do it. If it's a fa- fairly straightforward thing, that you all have the tools to do to do these things now. So, uh, and I think having seen so many small books, graphic books, um, press books, all the different things that we make for so many different areas, um, yeah, uh, photographers shouldn't leave money on the table. Put it that way. <laughs> it's true but the one challenge now with being a photographer and I guess being a musician is a very similar thing is we are now responsible singularly for our entire effort uh, whereas I think in generations past photographers looked after the the camera to uh, transparency and then probably commissioned the print after that but there was not a lot of marketing going on and if there was somebody else did it but now we look after all of it you know one minute one minute I'm admin next minute I'm cleaning the studio, the next minute I'm servicing cameras, the next minute I'm taking pictures, the bit that actually is the bit I love to do, of course. Then I'm post-production, I have to do all of that myself. It's not like there's a lab. Um, I mean, I know I can, I know I can outsource yeah, it. Yeah, I know, and I was listening to Jerry's, one of Jerry's talks, and all of his post-production, all of his editing, he sends out. He doesn't do anything yeah. himself. You know, and I think that for, if for your everyday average work, if, you, if your value in yourself is far greater than doing editing, then get somebody good to do it that you know, you can pay and you can earn more out of it. I think, you know, it's like sales. So often I hear people say, you know, I'm not very good at sales. Well, get a salesman in then, but I can't afford them. Do the numbers. Actually, there's, I've got a counter on that one. Uh, on the editing, it, it's, I've tried a couple of times. I still haven't yet found a comfortable relationship with, an, with a outsourcing. Uh, we did have one for, well, probably 10 or 15 years with a, a company that did all of our wedding stuff. And unfortunately, at the beginning of COVID, they decided that was the point they wanted to retire. So (laughs) I've got to figure that out this year. Uh, On the sales front, actually, uh, we've touched on it. So let's have a chat about that. Uh, Because it's one of the things um, I'm really quite passionate about, I suppose. I hate it when photographers say I'm passionate about something. (laughs) Because it it would sound so false, really. It just sounds like one of those words, you know. I'm going to exceed expectations. I'm going to be passionate about it. Um, But it's something that I care about quite a lot. And I care about it because I've learned to do it. Which is, as sales, you can't give sales to somebody else. Or rather, you can't give 
the entirety of the sales to somebody else because you as the That's person- there to be struck, you're right. You mean, I know that you well, and Sarah have arguments over what's saleable and what's great, what's award-winning, what's not, what's, what is the client going to buy, what's going to tell the story. And I think there's an element, and when I talk about sales, I don't mean specifically the after effect, you know, something, sales is seen as a bad, bad word. You know, it's the phone calls to the clients beforehand, getting them to want to come in, getting them to feel the reasons why they're coming in. It's, you know, the sale starts the moment that somebody looks at any of your images on Facebook or on, on your website or on Instagram. That's a sales point. And, and I think if, if you are nervous about selling your work, and many people are, you clearly are not nervous about selling your work. You always feel you could have done better, but that's the nature of being a creative. And, but but you're not nervous about it. There are many who just find it very difficult. And so find somebody who can and, and build that relationship with them. But I think my point, the point I was trying to get to, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't do my sales room. I don't run the sales room anymore. Um, I have a you know, Michelle and Sarah here who do, they look after all of that. And we did that by because by decoupling me, it gave us additional power in the sales room it gave the guys the ability to say no i agree with you that image isn't the best image or i disagree with you that image is great and i'm talking to you woman to woman or you know i've seen a lot of images but i'm not talking to you as the guy that created it i think the point that i was trying to get to isn't that bit is that it's the other bit which is that sales is about education sales is about having a client who understands what you do and why you're doing it and buys into that. And unfortunately, as the photographer, a big chunk of that process sits with you because you're the person that's going to spend an hour or two with that client or maybe longer with that client during the shoot. And so when we did our numbers, we, you know what I'm like for data, we have quite a lot of data. Uh, when we actually looked at where we had problems, a chunk of it was me. And now I know that yeah, here's me now, you know, with yeah, <laughs> but with a, you know with the podcast and the mastering portrait photography and the book and everything. Here's me saying, well, actually, the problem was me. I was the weak link, or one of the weak links in a process, because when I sat and listened to what Michelle was telling me about what the client said in the sales room, it was quite clear I hadn't given them given them everything they needed to make their decisions before they left the shoot. You have to do it during the shoot, you have to do it before, during and after the shoot. I do a whole setup. The shoot, the shoot itself, that. some photographers don't believe that they're selling, but you absolutely are during the shoot. You're, sure. you're absolutely creating that. Because ultimately it's not about how it looks, it's about how it makes you feel. And if yeah. you're reminding them about right. how they were feeling right. in that photograph every time they see it, and you you know you talk to them about it, of course, the, the photographer is the salesman. Yeah. I think yeah. I'm referring more to that help to close the sale, like you have, and and yeah. uh, and yeah. I think a lot of you know the, the too often I've sat with photographers uh, during their to, with their clients, and they've been they're just ashamed to ask for money, and I yes. think that's a tragedy, <laughs> isn't it? But if you think about it, think about this, right? My clients drive from all over the country and one or two from all over the world to come and be photographed here. What are they expecting? They're not expecting at the end of it to have wasted all that time and not have something. And yet as a photographer, we're embarrassed to ask them, what is it you want? Now, what is it you want and what is it I can give you might not match up or, might, or the desire for what I want to give you might not match up. There might be budgetary differences, stylistic differences, whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, my clients made a commitment, a commitment to spend time with me. I've given them my skills and they've given me their time and investment for something. And if, if you don't give them the opportunity to close that out, they're going to feel just as robbed as if you suddenly sprung a £10,000 bill on them. The psychologies are very similar. They're going to feel like you've stitched them because you haven't done the bit that's implicit in that relationship. And once you get your head around that, and also I don't sell, I'm not here to sell. I'm here to make people have an amazing time and create some feelings and emotions and play back how amazing I found them. That's what I do. But of course, that's also, the sales process. Often for, you know, quite a lot of the photographers sometimes when we talk to them don't appreciate that. The, the, that photograph appearing in their home that on their wall, however it happens to be, 
the key element is what you've got to get in their mind is how does this moment in time when we took this photograph, how were you feeling? And if I can recapture in your mind this feeling every time you see it with that family member, with that pet, whatever it happens to be, what would that be worth to you? And that's ultimately that value suddenly is not about the print, the frame, the piece of paper. It's that emotional value that they've invested during the shoot. The things that happened at yeah. that time, the people that were with them, and it's how that you know that's what's worth to them. And I think that suddenly, when you ask those questions, you know, what would it, what would it be worth to you if I could, you know, recapture this moment in time? And every time you look at it, when you walk yeah. through your door, no matter how shitty your day's been, you look at this picture and it brings a smile to your face. What would that be worth to you? You know, and it's priceless, isn't it? And it's and I think yeah, those are absolutely those priceless. Boys. Yeah. And I love it. I absolutely love it. But it took me a long time, I think, to settle into my skin. I did it. I was a natural enthusiast. Did you did you find it changed once you'd got your fellowship? Can I ask you that question? Uh, did you feel it set you free? <laughs> yeah, of course it did. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a fellowship or whether it's a nice reference or whether it's, uh, you know, an award of some description. You have, I, I, I think you have this kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it. You have an armory, I think. I don't like the, I don't like the, the nature of the word armory, but it's, it's sort of metaphorically like that. You have all of these things you can draw on, all of these skills and experiences, and you have chinks in your armor. And things like, in the end of the day, knowing I'm a fellow of the organizations, I'm a judge and all of these things gives me a degree of, you, you're never immune. <laughs> I was going to use the word immunity. You're never immune, right? If somebody says they don't like my photos, I die inside. I absolutely collapse. Even though I've got hundreds of clients who've said they love them. If I just get one snotty comment from uh, a judge or another photographer or a client, you know, I just, ah, how can yeah. you say that to me? Yeah, but that's oh, being a God. creative, isn't it? That, that, that's yeah, the can't be helped. Here's the weak, well, here's the weak spot, is if I'm right and I'm selling an experience, I'm selling memories, I'm selling an end-to-end -end set of emotions, I have to give all of me. I have to give every bit of me to that moment too. I can't expect my client to do it if I'm not doing it. And the challenge with that is every single pixel on those finished images mean something to me <laughs> and if my client or whoever's looking at the image doesn't feel i did that didn't achieve what i hoped i achieved then i just crumple of course i do i'm like every other flipping photographer weak uh, and things like the fellowship things like the fellowship um really help because not only did i learn a lot getting to it of course i did it was a learning process is if you think about photography and i've got a podcast on this and I've said this before, portrait photography, in particular portrait photography, is all in your head. Every single pixel is in your head. There's no barriers to entry. You could do this with an iPhone. You don't need a camera particularly. What you need is attitude, and that's all a mind-based game. It's not a 25 lights in a big studio game. That, you know, there are different types of photography, but portrait photography is about connections. So it's all in your head. And so things like, you're absolutely right, my fellowship unlocked some stuff in my head that now allows me to play, and more importantly, allows me to fail with such confidence that nobody pays any attention to it. You know, <laughs> I say to my client, you know, that, that I don't think, I, I say, I'll, I'll try something. I say, we're going to try this. I've never done this before, but we'll try it. If it works, of course, I smell awards. Uh, and if it doesn't work, I say, well, I was a Muppet. That's why I haven't tried it before. It's, it's interesting, it that me. over the last year, you know, having been introduced to some different photographers as well, and uh, the last time when we were out, at, uh, we did a live event at the Castle Bank in September um, I was introduced to Maurizio who's Alice's now husband um, and watching him work watching him do things that would have had him burnt at the stake um, with most of the photography associations but creating photographs picking up bits of plastic and, and chairs and doing things with these photographs in exactly the same location with the same lights with the same backdrop that Sarah Ferrara was doing and seeing 
just polar opposite results, but both yeah. absolutely stunning in their own way. And it showed to me these two sides, these two very complementary sides of of control, of structure, of posing, of point scoring, of fellowships, and of I don't give a damn. And I and you just wonder where is there is there a happy medium where photographers can work within that? And uh, and I no. and I've really enjoyed actually <laughs> seeing both sides, and I think it's quite a tough one. So. I don't think there's a happy medium. I think we're all insecure. Um, you know, but I, do, I mean, you know me, if you, if you get me on the topic of qualifications, I'm going to bang that drum. Do it, do it, do it. Because the, the, the structure and the process changes the way you think. It's not about, and I get banged. I, I get asked this all the time as a judge, as you can imagine. You know, why do you prioritize technique so much? Well, we don't really. What we prioritize, if you've got every single set of judges' notes, and I'm, I'm judging at the moment for a couple of organizations, and there'll be a podcast on what, again, it'll be a reiteration of the same stuff that we've heard year after year after year. But actually, at the top line item on every single judging notes that I get from every association says impact. <laughs> they all say the same, impact. And yet, of course, at the end of the day, we use technique and finesse as a way of teasing out the very best from the very, very, very best. That's what we're doing. So you need those techniques because they're what will make you just one mark better than the, or your photograph one mark better than the photograph next to it. So it's not about technique though, it's about emotion and impact and style and imagination, but you need the technique to bring that finesse to it. If, if competitions are your thing, if, if competitions aren't your thing, then you don't need any of that. What you need is impact and style. Well, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the com conversations, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, about there's a competition that's going to have during the photography show coming up. And the judges specifically are from two very different schools of thought. So for us, it's not it's as much about the competition, yes, but it's about listening to the live arguments and discussions between the judges. So I think that's going to be because too many people miss out on that opportunity, don't they? I think, yeah. At least it yeah. seems to me that you know people criticise judges and point scoring and the rest of it, but they don't actually go and watch or watch if they can online. Yeah. Any of the that's judges, I just listen yeah. to people. You know, listen to the judges discussing. I love it when you hear judges arguing things up or down, and uh, uh, and that for me, I think if people want to enter competitions, go and watch judging. Go and listen to it. Do it yeah, online or if you can go to it, just watch and listen to it. It's such an education to go. Do you know what? I, I understand it better now. And then they'll then they'll enter better better competition photos. Yeah, I'm going to give a quick plug to the BIPP, the British Institute of Professional Photographers, uh, because we recorded one for them the other day with Scott Johnson, with Sean Conboy and with Soraya Corterville, um, where we did do exactly as you described. We did a dummy judging of some historical images or images from a year or two ago, um, and we verbalised the judging. So we're not judging them as such. What we did was verbalise the process so that people could hear not just what each different photographer, so they've got, you've got uh, Soraya's travel and people and portrait and Sean is commercial architectural. And each of us looked at the images in a very different way. We, we dissect and dissemble them in slightly different ways because of the techniques we're bringing. And it's really interesting to hear those voices. And that's, I think that's going out as a, uh, as a video. So if you're a member of the BIP, oh, that'd be a good one to, that that, one. Yeah, excellent yeah. one for people to watch. I, I interviewed Sarah Ferrara about her life of competitions and how she, you know, wanted to win. She was, you know, she kept being knocked back, but she kept finding out why. And she kept, you know, didn't go, oh, yeah. this should have got such and such. It's a competition. <laughs> you know, there's other people in it, you know, and it's not about how great your image is, it's about how great your image is against other people's images. So, you know, it's, yes, right. and, and listening to her and when, and because that one actually went out um, during the first period of lockdown. So she was stuck at home in her flat on her own without her daughter. And so she was kind of pulling her hair out. But it was brilliant to listen to how she just kept at it, working, working, working. You know, I'm gonna win these competitions. I'm gonna do better. I'm gonna, and just, just taking, absorbing all that feedback, you know, that you give and the judges give. She said, I just listened to everything. And it was like a sponge. And, and it helped me just to keep tailing and trimming my images and getting better. Yeah. And looking at the competition, so uh, it's. Uh, it, and I don't think it's 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 all right to disagree with a judge. It's it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. If you listen to judging, if you listen to panel judging, where there's at least three judges or four judges, they will disagree. It's okay to disagree, but don't ignore. 
You might not agree with it, but bear that in mind. If, so, if a judge says, well, I've knocked marks off because of whatever it is, then you need to take that on board and decide whether your own taste, your own subjectivity is more important than one judge. And there are days when we all do that, which is, you know what, I know what the judges are saying, but listen, I don't give a flying toss about it. I'm going to do it anyway, because I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, don't, don't mix qualifications with competitions. Don't, yeah, don't absolutely. Just, that's, no. I think, another tragedy that people do. So I think, well, this, this got my license shot, or this got, yeah, great. Well, that's a different set of rules than a competition's going to have. So, um, but yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's true. It's, it's, I mean, musicians are like this, right? Yeah, I've worked with some incredible musicians. I've been truly lucky. And you listen to musicians doing their technique and learning their craft. And then you listen to what they actually play. And that technique and craft is in there. It's in their head. It's in their hands. It's in their heart. But what comes out is emotion and musicality. I and think one of the, the finest moments of music that I've been to was actually my brother's 60th birthday. He's been a musician, self-taught on almost every instrument, a brilliant guitarist. And he invited all of his muso friends who he's played in bands with and done stuff over the years to his 60th to this, um, this kind of village hall where there was a little stage there and he said, all the sounds to something, he said, bring your favorite instrument, come along and we'll just play. You can play a set for yourself with any of you want and we're just gonna jam. And it ended up with about 30 or 40 guys <laughs> up on stage playing. And in this village hall, there was like two sections. There was the kind of bit that you could hire, then there was the locals bar. And anyway, in the locals bar, you could see all these people dancing, jumping up and down. And people said, what's that band? They're amazing. Yet it was 35 or so random people who mostly didn't know each other, listening and playing and enjoying. Yeah. You know, they all clearly were brilliant at what they did. But, you know, and individually you could pick out, you know, when they were playing, how good they were. But they all just merged together to make this awesome sound, and and it's what made me appreciate you know, this the you know brilliant musicians' ability just to play with each other. I think it was quite quite phenomenal. Yeah, I did a, I did a wedding like that. I, I, it was a wedding of two professional opera singers, in top flight, world class opera singers, and they brought together all of their muso friends. Firstly, in the church, actually. So half the congregation were playing an instrument and even the vicar stopped and waited for them to finish the piece because we we're all enjoying it so much. And who's ever heard of a vicar allowing the music to, you know, we're going to wait for this. We're going to wait. Usually they tell the musicians to shut up. I know, I know. And then in the evening, they put together a scratch band and these were all West End musicians from all of the shows. And I thought I was a half decent drummer. I, well, I suppose probably half decent is probably the right terminology because having listened to this band, you're right. When, when you get class musicians together, it was a different world. It was something, it was just beyond anything I'd been stood in the middle of. Also have those same insecurities. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I went into the men's room halfway through the evening and I w went to go into one of the cubicles and there was a guy standing inside there with a saxophone, to, you know, with the door shut. I said, oh, are you using it? Yeah, I'm using it at the moment. And he was actually just playing inside the, in the men's cubicle, getting ready, getting ready to play because he was so nervous about playing in front of all these other musicians. So, um, yeah, same, sim similar insecurities will out on any, yeah. with any creator. And at the end of, the end of it, it'll be glorious and they'll get off stage and they'll come up to you and go, was that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am, I'm in tears because it was incredible. Uh, let's talk about the Live Lounge, which is actually uh, why today of all days I picked on you, not only to come and test my newfound video capability, um, thanks for doing that, but also to talk through something that I'm also part of uh, at the end of next week. So this is Saturday the 6th and Sunday the 7th of March, Saturday the 6th and Sunday the 7th of March. Tell me about this event. Okay, so the photography show that moved to September, they decided to do some virtual event. They did one last September that we were a part of and we had two days where we actually broadcast live for you know all day for both two days from the castle. And it was a really good event for us. I think the photography show struggled a bit with their platform, but you know we, we realized, you know what, this was a brilliant thing to do. So we did it again during imaging um, in the USA last month, and we learned a little bit more from that. And the photography show said, are you doing your live thing again? Said, yeah, we're gonna do it again, so we'll be broadcasting again. But essentially what we're doing, um, slightly different this year, we're gonna be broadcasting live from the castle, 
So there'll be some shoots from um, three specific, uh, two Italians, um, one um, uh, South American photographer doing live portrait shoots, editing and, and talking about their work. We will be doing some live stuff from in the UK. You very kindly have uh, agreed to come and do some work, do some work with us to do a, do a uh, hopefully a live shoot, yeah. live shoot, uh, <laughs> download, edit, and uh, uh, on on creating sale, creating portrait um, or create, having a portrait experience that you can sell well from. You know, to, and we've got um, similar. We've got Chris Chambers coming. We've got uh, Kate Hopwell Smith is going to talk about boudoir. Um, yourself, uh, Russ Jackson is going to be talking about how he shoots a newborn session. He's going to show you his newborn session specifically to sell. So it's not about the wrapping or any of those things. It's about what does he do to create enough photographs that people will buy more than just one. Um, and then he's going to talk about his sales process. Jerry Jonas is doing a session on on phoning and talking to your your JPEG only customers. They're, they reckon there's something like 53 million weddings in the US over the past few years that haven't had an album. And there's equal numbers of people in the UK have sold files only for so many jobs. And so we, we're going to help teach how can you reach out to those past customers to make sales where you didn't of printed products before. Um, who else have we got? Um, we've got... Um, Stuart Wood's coming down, so he'll be coming down for a conversation. We're going to have a have a bit of a riot with Stuart talking about his work with celebrities and how he deliberately made a conscious decision to, to move into the high-end wedding market and how he did it and how it's happened for him. Um, and then various others that are going to talk about newborns. Miranda I've already mentioned. She's going to talk about how she's made a success of magazines through not just through the school stuff that she's done, but business alliances with a kid's shoe shop, how it generated a large amount of leads. Um, and that's going to go on for two days, from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. Um, and we're going to have a competition too. First time ever we've really done this. We're going to have a photo competition, an image competition, open to everybody. Anyone can enter. Uh, it will be of families. It will be of people, basically. So it's got to be either families, a single person, a wedding, whatever it happens to be. Um, no, not really pets or newborns as such. It's got to be about people. Um, and... Uh, the great thing about it is the two different schools of thought that we're going to have. So let's, for the, for the sake of the argument, call it the fearless thought and the classical thought, should we say. Um, and I'm not saying that classical photographers are not fearless, because you are, without question. But it's that, you know, I've been through the processes, the judging, the qualifications and all of that style. So within the, within the groups there, we've got, from that side, we've got Erica and Lenny, uh, Lenny Mann, you know, the two mans. Awesome, yeah. very amazing star. Yeah. Uh, Craig Fritz, who you who you may know, he's a, uh, again part of a business in the USA. He was a photojournalist for a number of the newspapers and the magazines in the, in the states. Eve Sheps, he's going to be one of the judges, a Belgian quite amazing photographer. And then we've got from um, from the the English speaking world, Sarah Sarah Edmund, Sarah Ferrara, she's going to be one of the judges. Gerv Gavir Hal, he's going to be one of the judges, and Scott Johnson's going to be one of the judges as well. So we've got, we're going to have this kind of open round table of discussion about the, the top 10 photos. So we're looking forward to that too. Um, why are we doing it? Because we want to give photographers as much help as we can to reboot. We've, we talked through all these different things that we're doing. You know, we, went, we came from lockdown one, whereas you very kindly came on the, the, uh, the live interviews that we did in the first lockdown. And then we, then we had a little bit of an open, then we got to lockdown two, everybody started getting really depressed. And it was like, when, you know, WTF, what the hell are we gonna do? You know, life is so depressing. We're now coming out of that and it's proper reboot. Let's, let's grasp it now. So every single thing we're gonna talk about is how can you make money right now? What can you do from the resources that you've got with the customers, the past customers, the business alliances to make money right now? How can you set yourself up to make good money in the future? Uh, it's all related. Yes, it's going to be photo related. Yes, it's going to be product related. But it's all about how can you get into back into business now and get that, yeah. that cash flow working. So I'm really excited about it, actually. And uh, talking to everybody that's been being involved, um, everyone's going to what? I suddenly start to feel this buzz of something that's actually happening and um, we've hired a, a broadcast quality venue so we've got a massive two and a half thousand square foot room so we're going to set up safe locations for, for the for the live shoots and the interviews and things like that so um, 
it, it's going to be brilliant. I'm really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. I was impressed with your utter enthusiasm for photographers. How do you do it? How do you stay so positive dealing with, well, people like me? Uh, we have our moments. We have our days. You, know, you, might, <laughs> you might not see me on Facebook for a day or two or something. Uh, do you know what? I think it, uh, you know my history. Well, you know some of it. I do. And I think for me, you know, there's, there's a lot more that you don't know, but it's all brought me to a place where I value the photographs. I value so much the photographs that I have because the people that are no longer there. And for me, I, sometimes I find it very difficult when I see photographers who don't truly understand how important they are to their customers and how yeah. they, they're giving such an incredible gift to their customers and, and they don't give themselves that pat on the back or that credit of what's possible. The second part of it is I know what an amazing group of people are behind what we do inside Graphic Studio. They're all passionate. They're all photographers. You know, the chairman's a photographer. His daughters now have their own destination wedding photography. Well, they did, but, you know, that will start up yeah. again. You know, <laughs> everybody that's in that business is passionate about photography. Uh, to, you know, to spend the money that he did on a training location, which he really didn't need to do. He could have turned it into a nice home for himself and, and his family, but he didn't. He turned it into a place for people to go and learn to give back to the business that's made the success. And, and right now, just like everybody else, we're hurting. We know we, we, yeah. Our business has been decimated, but we're making the reinvestments. We've, we've made big changes in entire production to be ready for this time. And you, know you have two choices. You go, do you know what? Let's just get back on this horse and ride it, ride it until it's, you know, it, it's got to stop. Um, or we can just turn, <laughs> a, you know, turn, turn around and go, do you know what? Let's give up. You know, people. Yeah. You know, we we don't give up. We don't give up. And uh, and it's and it's. I think sometimes people think you know we are just a supplier. You don't do anything. You are. Do you know what? We only are successful if you are. We only make money if you're successful. We don't have. We don't supply to the public. We don't supply to camera clubs, or we don't have to supply to art businesses. But you know, we only supply to professional photographers. So without your success, we have nothing. You know, yeah. and, and that I think is why for me it's it's I, I know the company behind us is awesome. I know the people behind it are awesome. Like any company you have your challenges. But the the thoroughness of the plans that the chairman's put in, the people down from Dario, Daniele and the others who are all passionate about making this business work. You know, we're in a small town in the north of Italy where there's not really much other work out there. You know, they people need us and they want us to be successful. So um, and I have a good group of friends in this industry. And I think to, that for me is what makes it work. You know, the, the volume of good people far outweighs the, uh, the detractors and, the, uh, and those that make your life difficult. So I think that in, in more than one word, that's why I try and <laughs> remain positive. I never asked you to say it in one word. I just asked you to describe it. Um, I think I th it's, it's true, I think, in this industry, well, I think it's true of a lot of this type of industry, but it's particularly true in portraiture or sorry, in social photography, weddings and portraits. I think you have to care. My suppliers have to care, too. I, you know, the, the, I don't like to go too far down the sentimental road because that's not really what I'm talking about. But I do think you have to have you have to have really positive feelings about this thing, both to your clients, to your craft, to the product and to the people you work with and the people you work around. And you have to have respect and passion for it. You have to. Um, or else what you're creating is just three megapixel, or, you know, three million light dots Absolutely. on a piece of paper. And, and and it's, it's the, same, it's the same from, you know, the chairman. From, and this is where it all, all comes from. He wants the very best quality printing. You know, he sees the investments that photographers make in cameras. And the chips on the cameras now are just getting better and better and better <laughs> and bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's going, look, I want photographers to be able to print that stuff. I want them to have the ability to go, I can print exactly what I've seen on my camera. You know, that, and so he's always, or, or even like with the new storybook that we're just launching, I've found this paper that's made the same way it was for the last 200 years in a paper mill with with steel with old granite wheels that drive and grind yeah. the cotton together 
and it makes these individual sheets that every sheet is different, has a different ink absorption rate across the paper, let alone between the pages. And I want to make that into a, into a classically Italian product. And he has, and, you know, it took them a year, 18 months to be able to do it, but we've worked out how to do it. And uh, so I think it's that, that passion to give you something that you, you know, you could be proud of. You know, you've worked so hard to create these great images. You want to be able to put them on something, A, that's going to last a lifetime, because ultimately that's what this is for. Because often the photographs aren't necessarily for the person that you're shooting them for. They may be at the beginning, but actually it's going to be the generations down the line who are really going to benefit from those photographs. And I think that's part of the challenge for, for photographers too, is the fact that getting across, particularly to younger wedding couples who've never really had anything printed, you know, we, we've had this conversation before, but when we used to go on holiday as kids, you'd send off the films to uh, Snappy Snaps or whatever, and back would come a big bag with full of these prints, and you'd open them up <laughs> and start to look at them. Um, and, and now you look back on those, and you can open them up and yeah. you look on them. Generations now haven't ever had that. So yeah. giving them that possibility in, in an album or a piece of wall art for their family, for their children, to be sitting down and opening up the album, you know, how many people have gone back and looked at their wedding album during the lockdown period? I bet you there's a lot. How many of those have not been able to because they never had one? I bet there's a lot of those too. So, you know, it's, yeah. for me, it's, it's giving people those chances, those opportunities, uh, you know, to give you, you know, give you guys the best, really, I think. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, I believe firmly that when I hand over something that's tactile, there's a huge amount of power to that. And that's the one thing I don't make. <laughs> I create the images. I do all of that. But at the end of the day, I'm relying on you and others like you to actually put that down onto, into a physical form that I know my clients will love for the rest of their days. Uh, wonderful. It's lovely. You know it's lovely to talk to you, Jeremy, as always. How do people find out about the Live Lounge? Do you have to be a member of anything to you join? Know, we're going to broadcast it through the Photography Show's own um, okay. live platform, so you can register there. It's free to register. We're also going to be live via um, our YouTube live channel, so Graphic Studio on YouTube uh, forward slash live. It's going to be on Instagram. It's going to be on Facebook. We're putting it out everywhere. So okay. if you're in the Graphic Studio Facebook community, you can you can you'll see us there. Uh, but if you want to go to our, we'll we'll put an announcement on our website. I'll send you a link to send out to all of your friends and okay. family. Um, it's basically anyone in your photographer family, you know, that wants to find out more about pretty much anything to do with, with photography. We don't discuss pricing on there, so it is because it will be on a public forum, so we won't be getting into conversations of how much things are, um, but, um, but it will be on there for everybody to see the content, so you can find it anywhere. Critically too, I didn't mention this, in the competition there's about 1,500 pounds worth of prizes to be won. Very so, good. you know, think about your photograph. I will announce that and I'll send you a link to that announcement so that um, people can see it on uh, Mastering Portrait Photography. Um, we will be going out at 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night to cover all European markets and, and, and American markets too with uh, some great speakers from the USA, from Italy and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the UK, of course. So, we're looking forward to that. I'm very much looking forward to having the ability to welcome some of my good friends, including yourself, back to uh, <laughs> back to the real world uh, next month. <laughs> I love the idea that being in a studio with you is the real world. Mm. Uh, that's, I think that's more of a, that's more of a fantasy than a real world for me. Uh, yeah, on that happy note, and this is a shameless plug just for me, I'm on a Sunday the 7th at 3.30 UK time, that's 4.30 European time and the heady time that's 10:30 a.m. Eastern US time Eastern US time so uh, for my friends in Europe you should be just tucking into your third or fourth gin, or, gin and tonic uh, for my friends in the US except for one or two who probably will also be tucking into their third or fourth gin and tonic it should be a cup of coffee and a bagel or something like that uh, so yeah, 3.30 UK time uh, for me. And I cannot tell you how excited I am. More than anything, you can feel it in my voice, right? You can feel the excitement as things are starting to change. So to just finish off this podcast, I want to say thank you to Jeremy for agreeing to uh, join me. I have one last question for you. And I forgot, I forgot to tell you this was coming, though you may have remembered from the first time I interviewed you. Do you have a book 
And I'm gonna, I'll carry on chatting and give you a moment to think about it. Do you have a book that you would recommend to add to my library, as much of which is now right behind me on these shelves, having tidied up? Because uh, I felt the, the, the stack of crap <laughs> that was on these shelves behind me. <laughs> Sean Conboy the other day said, have you made an effort or did you just sit down at your desk and say, oh, I better tidy that up, haven't I? Uh, it's now part of the library behind me here. So while I'm just finishing up, uh, have a think about that, Jeremy. I'm expecting a book title from you. Uh, any book that you think a photographer would find fascinating, inspiring, interesting, a good read. Uh, we have everything from novels. I think, um, yeah, Perfume is on here somewhere because someone recommended that as a great novel. I've got biographies because they found them inspiring. Uh, just something uh, that uh, you can think of. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm giving you a couple of minutes. I'm pausing here. I'm just doing my wrap-up so you've got a chance to think. Uh, so, yeah, it's got to be something that would be... Um, useful. Uh, on that happy note, before I go back to Jeremy for his nominated book, because I forgot to ask him in advance. Uh, remember, you can uh, subscribe to all of the podcasts. This will be the first video podcast. <laughs> Something else I did tell Jeremy, but he didn't read his email. Uh, so he's feeling a bit, a bit insecure that he's not dressed in his usual f underdressed. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's not dressed in his usual flashy suit. Uh, but other than that, I think he looks damned fine. Uh, so I'm going to run with running this as a video podcast, and I'm very excited about that particular capability for our interviews going forwards. Uh, you can always subscribe to the podcasts. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, uh, Deezer, Radio Public. Oh, the list goes on and on and on. And, of course, you can always just hop across to the home of the podcast, which is Mastering portraitphotography.com. If you have any feedback, any, I mean, obviously it's nice to have nice reviews. Uh, if you want, no, yes, yeah, shut up, Jeremy. If you want nice, we like nice reviews. You can post those publicly. And if you feel like emailing me, it always makes me feel good. If there are things we can do to improve, well, I'd rather you emailed me quietly. Because, <laughs> I don't, you know, I'd like to be able to make the changes, but I don't want the world knowing. Uh, that, if you want to get hold of me, shut up, Jeremy. That, if you, that, that, if you want to get hold of me, my email, well, is Paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. Unless, unless the comment is, please get better guests, obviously. Uh, my email is my email is paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. And on that happy note, I'm going to go back to Jeremy, who's been scribbling something on a bit of paper. What is it you think photographers would find interesting? Okay, so this isn't specifically for photographers, but it's got to have been one of the, the, the most inciting, but insightful books that I've read, actually. Yeah, probably slightly inciting too, but uh, um, thoroughly enjoyed it. If you follow a little bit of politics and you know what's going on, this has got to have been one of the greatest insights I've had of to the absolute rubbish that goes on inside the world of politics. And it's the diary of an MP's wife. Um, brilliant. It is a brilliant, brilliant. book. Um, it, the, and I know the, um, the, the Sasha Swire who wrote it has been pilloried by many MPs of what she said about them and the things she's talked about them and the things that she wrote down during the period of time with Cameron and, and Blair and all sorts of other people. And so for me, it's been one of those books that you can actually just use you know, pick up and put down. You don't have to binge read it all the time, but it's just, oh my God, really? She thought that? He said that? No way. And um, be left, left leaning, right leaning, center leaning. It's a brilliant read to, because she doesn't hold any punches on anyone. So for me, that's a, that's a must read anyway. Fantastic. I will put the link for that in the show notes. I will also put, <laughs> there you go, there you go. Been held up to your screen if you're watching this on video. Uh, if you're listening to this in the car, keep your eyes on the road. Oh, it's right? an Just audible book as well. It. It's an audible. You can get it on audible. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I will put the link to that. I will also, when Jeremy sends it across, I'll put the links to the Graphic Studio Live Lounge and all of the uh, information that you need. I'll also put that into the show notes because we would love, we would dearly love to see you there. There's quite a lot of us creating content in the background, creating content that goes out. We sort of fire it and forget it. It would be lovely to think some of our regular listeners and some of our regular members from uh, Mastering Portrait Photography would be there to make just a little bit of a friendly crowd. And on that happy note, thank you, Jeremy. My pleasure. Been thoroughly enjoyable, as always. Uh, next time we get a kebab. <laughs> yeah, next time we're going to do it with two microphones sitting in a bar, mate. We're going to do this after the, was it the 21st of June? I think they've said all restrictions are off. 
Uh, maybe we'll get that opportunity, if not before sitting in a park somewhere. I hope, I do hope so, though this has actually been an absolute delight. So on that happy note, remember whatever else, guys, get your vaccine and take care of yourself. Good night. I don't know why I said good night. <laughs> it's, it's the fucking afternoon. <laughs> on that happy note, cheers, guys. Bye.